We must now move on to questions to the Minister of Enterprise, Trade and Investment. I have to tell members that question 12 has been withdrawn, and I call Mr. Cathal Washi. Question 1. Promotion of coastal routes is an important activity for Tourism Ireland, as research confirms that visitors who come here by car or who hire one while here tend to tour more widely, stay longer and spend more on their trip. I recently had discussions with the Chief Executive of Tourism Ireland and expressed my disappointment about how the promotion of the Wild Atlantic Way stops at the border. I have asked that the Wild Atlantic Way and the Causeway Coast and Glens coastal route should in the future be marketed together by Tourism Ireland and given equal prominence. Mr. Washington, for supplementary. Uh, I thank the Minister for her answer. Does the Minister agree with me that an uh, important economic uh, interest may have been missed here in that this has not been developed as a single route which would have stretched from Yeoll and County Cork right all the way around perhaps to Ballycastle? Well, can I say to you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I, I was rather disappointed, and it's one of the reasons I asked to speak to the Chief Executive of Tourism Ireland about the issue, because I did feel that the Causeway Coast and Glens, of course, has received many accolades uh, from right across the world in relation to uh, its beauty. And uh, uh, I just was disappointed that it wasn't added on to the Wild Atlantic Way. At least uh, together, the two of them could have been uh, a very good uh, promotion. Uh, and it would allow people to have travelled uh, wherever along that route uh, and indeed, as I'm sure he would welcome, the opportunity to stay in different areas and, and indeed spend money as well. So, as I say, I have asked that the two are promoted together now and I hope that that will be the case. Mr Patsy McGlow. Thanks very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. I guess I thank the Minister for her response. On a wider issue, uh, could the Minister advise us please just what discussions she has had with other executive colleagues around the reduction of VAT to the hospitality sector and indeed what correspondence or uh, uh, discussions have been had between the executive and the Treasury on this very issue? Thank you. I thank the member for his question. This is a, a very big issue for the hotels uh, right across Northern Ireland, but particularly those hotels who operate uh, along the border, uh, and indeed uh, restaurants uh, and other providers as well, because they feel that they are at a competitive disadvantage in relation to the VAT rate charged in Northern Ireland as opposed to in the Republic of Ireland. And you could see. Uh, how important uh, it was to the tourism industry in the Republic of Ireland, the fact that it has stayed in the budget again uh, very recently for another period of time. Uh, I very much support the Hotel Federation's campaign to have a VAT reduction, not just here in Northern Ireland, but across the United Kingdom. Uh, I think, again, it is an indicator of the fact that we have London and the rest of the United Kingdom. So, as regards London, um, they, it doesn't matter what they charge in terms of that, they will continue to have the tourists come uh, and visit. But the rest of the regions outside of London have a, a, a different uh, problem. Uh, and therefore, I really do believe a government needs to look at this whole issue of that in relation to tourism provision. Uh, and I very strongly support the campaign that's going on from the Hotel Federation and indeed from colleagues in this House and indeed in Westminster as well to try and push uh, that issue to the top of the agenda. Well, Ms. Claire Sugden. Um, I, I understand the Minister is working with other um, executive departments to promote a strong tourism strategy with, uh, within the North Coast. Um, how will the route uh, play a part in this? Well, the Causeway Coast and Glen, and indeed the Causeway Coast and Glen, uh, apart from just the, the driving route, but generally uh, that destination is a very significant destination in terms of our tourism uh, promotion for Northern Ireland. Uh, it uh, plays host to our um, two of the top visitor attractions in Northern Ireland, namely the Giants Causeway Visitor Centre and indeed the wider uh, World Heritage Site and Bushmills uh, Distillery. Uh, so those are both in the Causeway Coast and Glens area uh, and uh, still remain a very key part of our tourism promotion uh, right across the world. And can I in that context say uh, that I welcome the engagement I have had with the new owners um, uh, through Diageo uh, of Bushmills Distillery. I look forward to meeting uh, with the new owners in due course after they have been through uh, some legal processes and I welcome them to Northern Ireland 
Ireland as an inward investor, and we look forward to doing business with them. Mr. Stephen Mutry for a question. The regional start initiative has delivered a total of 1,224 business plan approvals for the southern region, including Upper Ban, for the period October 2012 to September 2014. This is against a two-year target for the southern region of 1,280. The Regional Start Initiative is delivered on behalf of Invest Northern Ireland by Enterprise NI and provides individuals who wish to start their own business with advice and the capability to produce a business plan. This business plan will provide a template for the new entrepreneur to plan and access sources of funding. The programme has been successful across Northern Ireland and we are on track to achieve our contractual targets. Well, Mr. Mutri for supplementary. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her response today. Can I ask her, can she give us an update in relation to the amount of business Invest NI has carried out in the Upper Band constituency over the past two years? Well, certainly, uh, Invest NI have been very active in the Upper Band uh, constituency. We have had 583 offers of support, totalling 18.18 .18, uh, million of assistance, contributing to 81 million of investment uh, in the region. Uh, we've had uh, nearly 1,000 new jobs promoted, and that includes the regional uh, start initiative jobs. And uh, their assistance per head of population compared with the uh, Northern Ireland average, which is 161, is 174. So Invest are very much involved in the Upper Ban area, and I do want to pay tribute uh, to the business owners in Upper Ban for their very positive and forward-looking approach uh, to dealing uh, with um, not only Invest NI, but uh, others in the area as well. I know they work very hard uh, with the Council to promote uh, the region uh, in Craigavon. I'm thinking particularly now, they work very hard to promote themselves as a region for investment, uh, and I will continue to work with them, uh, the business owners, the Council, and all of the other partners in the Upper Ban region. Call Mrs. Dolores Kelly. Could I ask the Minister, are there any specific measures or targets which could be introduced or are already in, in existence to encourage more women and people from an ethnic minority background to participate in the programme? Yes, there are uh, specific targets. I'm sorry I just don't have them to hand uh, at present, but I'm happy to share them with the member in relation to female entrepreneurship uh, in general. I'm not sure if it goes down as low as a constituency level, but certainly on a Northern Ireland level, uh, we do have very good working relations with um, particular bodies. Uh, and uh, There's a lady in Invest in Northern Ireland who takes the lead on this called Sharon Polson, and I will share the rest of the information with her when I have it to hand. Well, Mrs. Joanne Dobson for a question. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Question number three. In the first six months of this financial year, Invest Northern Ireland offered a total of £126 million across its full range of services, including investment announcements. I am pleased to advise that Invest NI will be presenting full details of its mid-year performance review to the Enterprise Trade and Investment Committee tomorrow, the 11th of November. Sorry, Ms. Dobson for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can I thank the Minister for her answer? Uh, the Minister has outlined the considerable financial commitment which her department has made to support Invest NI job creation announcements, and she will be pleased, no doubt, with the proposed budgetary uplift her department is receiving for next year. But does she share my concerns that a lot of, the, a lot of these recent Invest NI announcements have also come from promises of R&D support from the Department of Employment and Learning, which is seeing its budget face a major cut? Well, I'm not sure um, which um, R&D projects she's speaking about, because I know for sure that um, Invest Northern Ireland have supported a number of R&D projects going forward, um, thinking most recently of the Seagate announcement in Londonderry, a very big announcement was made in relation to research and development, I think, in the region of £38 million. Pounds, and that will not only secure those jobs uh, at Seagate, but will make it a very sustainable uh, company moving forward for the next five to ten years. And it was a very significant announcement for us. And indeed, we are having discussions with other firms right across Northern Ireland in relation to research and development. And normally, when I look at research and development, these are big. big they inevitably involve a lot of money, Mr Deputy Speaker, and because of that, um, we have a situation 
which uh, the Finance Minister has referred to as uh, good pressures on the budget. Um, I may in future have to bring those good pressures uh, to the executive table so that I will get the support of colleagues to try and facilitate those pressures because we are moving to a situation where we're moving away from selective financial assistance as a tool to help companies and more into the remit of research and development. And as we do so, the amounts of money uh, tend to grow and uh, that will put a lot of pressure on my budget and on the budget generally. Um, just in relation to the draft budget, the member is right to mention that uh, I, we have been able to uh, have an additional 37.7 million to cover existing inescapable pressures, pressures again brought about by the success uh, mainly of Invest Northern Ireland. Uh, but I do also have to apply a 15.1% reduction uh, to the department's baseline, and that's a 27.9 million uh, cut to areas that are already significantly committed. So, there, uh, there is good news in relation to the draft budget, as far as I'm concerned, but there Minister's are also pressures. Call Mr. Martin and uh, th These are questions rather than congratulations, but the Minister has outlined a stunning series of investment uh, coups by, by Invest NI in recent months. Uh, my question to the Minister is, uh, how do we maintain this momentum? How do we surpass the achievements, the, the spectacular achievements, especially uh, up at the, 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 in the run-up to the summer and during the summer, uh, and in particular, how important is political stability and political progress to maintaining that momentum? I thank the member for his question and welcome him uh, to the House, and I hope he continues with his positive outlook uh, in relation to the economy. Um, can I just say that uh, we have had a very good period of time, and, and Invest Northern Ireland will give those results to the EDI committee uh, tomorrow. Uh, but we have to be realistic and, and, and respect the draft budget. Um, I will be in bilaterals with the Finance Minister in relation to the allocations in the draft budget, uh, but we do have to live within our means. I do think um, that the, um, it is important that we continue to send out a very positive message about Northern Ireland as a good place to do business. Uh, as a good place with good people to do business and we should very much not forget the political stability that we have here and continue to make it a lasting political stability because what has come from that has been a tremendous benefit to everybody and I know sometimes Deputy Speaker there's frustration with this place but when you look at the difference in terms of the companies that are investing here now as opposed to 10 years ago I think we should very much relish the political stability that we have. Yeah. Call Mr. Trevor Lund. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, could I ask the Minister what, what does she think would be the impact on Invest NI's ability to attract jobs in the future if budget cuts force our local universities and colleges to shrink in size? I congratulate the member on getting a Dale question into me here at Dette, but uh, however, I'll still take it. Um, I do very much. Um, I think that we need to ensure that we have a supply of young, skilled people coming forward uh, for the jobs market. Now, we do realise that the draft budget is in front of us. It is a draft budget. Uh, we now need to look at all of the consequences of that draft budget and then work it through it uh, with the Finance Minister and with the rest of the Executive. But it is vitally important that we send out a message that we are open for business and that involves having young people and older people as well with all the appropriate skills uh, and uh, I hope that's the answer he wanted. Mr Gordon Dunn for a question. Question number four please. Energy costs are determined by the market subject to regulation. The executive strategic energy framework balances our need to provide security of supply and address carbon emissions at the lowest cost to all consumers. I have supported this through promoting competition, innovation and investment. For example, we are putting over £30 million into extending gas to the West to benefit consumers with greater fuel choice. On electricity, I will take account of ongoing works by the regulator and my department, covering all elements of cost as we go forward. In particular, I have been considering the cost of the Northern Ireland Sustainable Energy Programme and recently wrote to the regulator about this. Mr Dunford, supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answers. I think we all do welcome the news last week of a new agreement between Sony, the systems operator, and AES or generators for extra generation capacity for Northern Ireland. Can the Minister elaborate on the significance of this in relation to security of supply? 
for Northern Ireland. I thank the member for his comments in relation uh, to the recently announced agreement uh, between Sony and uh, AES to put in place a contract which will provide extra generation capacity uh, to meet projected shortfalls uh, over the coming years. So there will be an additional 250 megawatts of generation capacity from January 2016 for an, an initial three years so that we can assess uh, whether that is enough or whether we need to look at it uh, again. And that, together with short and longer term repair of the Moil interconnector, uh, will provide a sufficient safety margin uh, in the medium term. So, obviously, we're dealing with pressures that have been identified, but in the next decade, we very much need to see the implementation of the second north south interconnector. Uh, and I know that's a subject I've talked about quite a lot in this House, but we really need to see progress in relation to that. Well, Mr. Phil Flanning. I will the free or less concord because go and book a session areas up to a fragri. Um, with, with a planted question from a colleague, I thought we were going to hear something new or, or positive. Um, but can I, can I say to the Minister that it's, it's not good enough that we have announcements from Sony or AES on new supply with no details on the cost? And I know this isn't something that's the direct, direct responsibility of the Minister. But does the Minister have any indication um, as to when we can expect to see details on the cost of this new supply? Well, uh with a question from you, I would quite like to have a translation of your Gaelic before you start your actual question, but however, that's a matter for the Deputy Speaker, not for me. Um, in relation to uh, this issue, it is a matter for the systems operator to put the contract uh, into place. There will be some cost impacts that has never been hidden uh, on consumer bills, uh, but the costs uh, have been minimised through the competitive tendering uh, process that's in place and will be around five pounds, that's five pounds per annum on average to the domestic bill. Well, Mr. Danny Kinnahan. Thank you. I thank the Minister for her answer so far. Um, could you give us an update on where maybe you're bringing pressures on the interstate connector and whether there's more that can be done on that? Thank you. Well, in relation to the north-south interconnector, as I understand it, uh, the Republic of Ireland planning um, process has not really begun in earnest as yet in terms of the application has to go back into onboard Planala, as I understand it. Uh, in relation to uh, Northern Ireland, our application is now with the PAC. I would hope that we can proceed as quickly as possible, but that isn't a phrase that I use very often in relation to the north-south interconnector because it has been dreadfully slow. Uh, and as a result of not making process, uh, progress in relation to the north-south interconnector, we are having to take steps in relation to additional generation because, let me say this to the House, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I am not in the business of allowing us to get into a situation where lights will go out. That's not what I'm in the business of doing. I'm making sure that we have enough capacity going forward and certainly from 2016. Well, Mr Tom Elliott for a question. Uh, question number five, Deputy Speaker. Going for growth is a strategy for the entire agri-food sector and farmers are an integral part of this sector. A sustainable primary production sector will be crucial to the success of growing for growth and delivering on the Agri-Food Strategy Board's strategic vision to grow a sustainable, profitable and integrated agri-food supply chain focused on delivering the needs of the market. I call Mr Elliott for supplementary. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker, and uh, thank the Minister for that update. But uh, has the Minister, uh, within either the, the Daddy budget or separately within the Invest NA budget, uh, any direct uh, financial input to going for growth and anything built into those two budgets? Well, of course, Invest NI uh, plays a very important role in going for growth, and we continue to provide very significant um, local uh, input in relation to companies. In the first half of 1415, Invest and I has made over 200 offers of assistance to the food sector, uh, totaling £21 million, which is a, a record level uh, of support. £170 million expansion by Moy Park, of course, has been announced as well, with 628 new jobs across Dungannon, Craigavon, and Ballymena. A £20 million expansion. Uh, in Dale Farm, um, again to allow them to expand their sales outside 
uh, of Northern Ireland, and a £6 million investment by Ballyrushane uh, Creamery as well to grow its European business. So there's been quite significant uh, investments made in relation to Invest Northern Ireland, and uh, I hope that DARD will continue in its commitment as well uh, to help ensure that this vital sector continues to grow. Well, Mr. Paul Frew. Mr. Deputy Speaker, uh, I note the, the executive's response to uh, going uh, for growth, uh, Minister. Uh, can I ask about the timescales for the objectives and whether they can be met and be uh, to the utmost uh, ad ad advantage to the agri-food industry? And also, can I ask for details on our thoughts around the single agri-food marketing organisation? Well, in relation to timescales, um, certainly from the point of view of the marketing review, uh, which is undergoing um, some focus at the moment. I very much hope to see results from that before Christmas. Um, I hope officials will provide me with the way forward. As you know, there are a number of engagements going on at the moment around uh, marketing and how this can be achieved going into the future to give a, a single voice to the agri-food sector here in Northern Ireland. And it's not without its challenges because different parts of the sector will have different ideas as to how they want uh, their particular sector uh, marketed. But I very much want to see a decision in relation to that issue uh, before Christmas so that we can move on and actually implement uh, marketing for agri-food here in Northern Ireland. Mr. Joe Byrne. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I thank the Minister for her answers and in particular the comments she made about the dairy processing industry. The Minister will be aware that the Chinese market is potentially very lucrative particularly for the milk powder and some baby food products. Can the Minister state what representations, if any, has she had from Northern Ireland companies that have not yet been able to go to China, given that the Republic did have a big delegation there within the last two weeks and very successive uh, indications are coming about the potential that is there for this product? Well, I thank the member for his question. Indeed, I did note um, uh, from the Farming Life on Saturday that there were some concerns in relation to that trade mission that some Northern Ireland firms had expressed a desire to go on the mission and they haven't been uh, facilitated. And it's something that I, I will look into because um, if we are to work together collaboratively on issues uh, as far away as China, then it would be helpful if we could ensure uh, the companies who want to avail of those facilities are allowed to do so. Uh, so it's something, and funny, I was speaking to Simon Coveney about the milk sector very recently, uh, and so it's disappointing that those companies haven't been uh, allowed to uh, attend, and I'm not sure whether it was dairy companies, just to be clear, I'm, I, I didn't read into uh, what, uh, which companies weren't allowed to proceed to that. Uh, I have been speaking to um, a number of dairy companies in relation to the pressures that they face at present, um, not only in relation to China, but the whole price volatility that there is at present, and of course uh, the Russian uh, ban on agri-food um, from a European destination. Uh, so there are a lot of pressures on the dairy sector at the moment. We uh, keep very close to them and uh, see what it is we can do to help them, because sometimes it's not about finance, it's not about the money, it's about how we can make representations on their behalf, either at Westminster or indeed at Brussels as well, and we will continue to make those representations and to work alongside the sector. Well, Mr. Leslie Cree for a question. Question number six, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and for Fuselio, she'd read Dragoons. In any event, uh, <laughs> the Northern Ireland Tourist Board has not been approached to commemorate the role of the Enniskillings uh, at the Battle of Waterloo. Uh, I think that's the Dragoons you're mentioning. Is that right? Okay. Uh, NITB is, however, currently working alongside tourism partners in Fermanagh uh, on the Heritage Gateway to Fermanagh project, and that will see uh, radical refurbishment of the Enniskillen Castle complex that currently houses the Enniskillings Museum. Call Mr. Cree for a supplement. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. And I know the Minister is aware that Arthur Wesley, arguably Britain's greatest soldier, was born in Dublin or thereabouts, was the sponsor of Catholic emancipation and defeated Napoleon at the Battle of Waterloo in 1815. Um, surely that centenary, this is actually a bicentenary now, um, deserves to be commemorated and, uh, and so doing presents a unique opportunity for, to attract tourists. And, uh, the member will be delighted to hear that our national government have uh, advanced plans in relation to 
celebrating the Battle of Waterloo. Um, they have been over to the site and I think have actually um, donated a million pounds to help with the upgrade of the site in relation to uh, 2015. And certainly with the Inniskillings connection, we will want to ensure that our voice is heard in relation to any benefit that we can achieve there as well. So given that we have stepped forward in relation to a number of these very significant commemorations, we certainly should ensure that our voice is heard in relation to the Battle of Waterloo as well. We should claim it as our own. Call Mr. William Humphrey. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister, the Minister will be aware that uh, the nation remembers this week. We also should remember the, the contribution of HMS Caroline in the First World War, in particular the Battle of Jutland. Can I ask if, and for an update on the role of that vessel, so important to the people of Belfast and Northern Ireland as we move forward? Yes, indeed. And in terms of uh, what's happening here uh, from a national perspective, HMS Caroline is a key priority, um, not just for me and for Detty, and not just for Northern Ireland, but also for the UK government. Um, and the Prime Minister has announced a national event on the shipping plan for May of 2016. Uh, very much welcome that, and that, of course, is part of the World War I centenary uh, commemoration. So, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, the Heritage Lottery Fund confirmed an award of £11.5 million to the National Museum and uh, Dette, and we're using that to conserve and actually display HMS Caroline, and we're contributing an additional £2.7 million in match funding uh, to the project. So, very much looking forward to the commemorations and look forward to the fact that uh, Caroline will be part of a national celebration here in Northern Ireland. Mrs. Karen McKevitt. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Question seven. With your permission, Mr. Speaker, I will answer questions seven and ten together. Since the creation of the Tourism and Events Funding Programme by NITB, the level of funding provided for events has varied from year to year. In spite of the pressures faced within this current financial year, I have allocated additional resources to the NITB for events, and a total of 76 events are due to be supported in 2014-15 through the allocation of £2.8 million, which should provide significant benefits to the local economy. Pending clarification of the budget position in 15-16, the Tourist Board announced the suspension of the application pro process for events for next year. That was a prudent step given the present very difficult financial situation. In light of the draft budget allocations which have now been announced, the Department is engaging with all of its arm's length bodies on the savings which will need to be made. The position regarding support for events going forward is being assessed uh, as part of that work. Nevertheless, I can confirm that nine international events, which received three-year funding letters of offer for 14-15 through to 16-17, will continue to be supported, as well as the tall ships and the Irish Open in 2015. Mr. McEvitt, for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister um, for her question? Can I ask the Minister what recent discussions she's had? Um, with the British government and the Irish government on the benefits um, to the local economy of joint funding um, on tourism events on an all-Ireland basis. Well, can I say to the member, this is not something new because in relation to the Irish Open, uh, she probably knows that there is uh, some joint funding that goes on there. So uh, when the Irish Open came to Royal Portrush, we were able to avail of uh, some money, money from Falja, Ireland. Uh, and indeed, when the Irish Open then returned to the Republic of Ireland, uh, the Northern Ireland Church Board had some funding uh, there as well. So it depends on the events. It uh, depends on whether we believe that there are benefits uh, to us here in Northern Ireland as to whether uh, we should get involved in events in the Republic of Ireland and, I suppose, vice versa from their perspective as well. Uh, but let me say this uh, to the member. Uh, I'm not going to turn away funding from any source. Uh, so if there's money uh, in the Republic of Ireland to help us with events in Northern Ireland, please give it up to me. Well, Michelle McElveen. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I welcome the Minister's comments. Um, obviously, there are events such as, as the Milk Cup, which have been receiving funding from Deddy in the past, and there has been an absence of um, substantial funding from, from DECAL. Can I ask what discussion she's had with that Minister um, for events which would naturally fall within her department? 
Well, certainly there are a number of our large-scale events which, if you like, straddle between sporting and uh, the events uh, um, capacity to bring in tourists here to Northern Ireland. So there are a number of those, Milk Cup being one of those, uh, Giro d'Italia, another very good example. Um, and in the past, there have been discussions between officials in relation to what money uh, DECAL could help uh, provide to some of those large-scale events. Um, I, if the DECAL minister was here, she would say that it's an event primarily and therefore it falls to Getty through the events fund. But I think there are other things uh, that can be helped with and whether that's DRD in relation to road safety, perhaps the North West 200 or DECAL in relation to Sport NI, uh, we need to perhaps look at other departments to help bolster the events fund uh, in NITB. Order. That ends the period for list of questions. We will now move on to topical questions. Question one has been withdrawn. And I call Mr. Paul Given. Mr. Given. The Minister will be aware of the work that had been undertaken by an executive subcommittee uh, to deal with the draft Belfast Metropolitan Area Plan uh, up until the point in which the Environment Minister acted unilaterally and published a report with the inclusion of an element that would have economically disastrous consequences, uh, for example, in Sprucefield within my own constituency. Is the Minister able to update the House in terms of the judicial review that her department has taken to deal with the breach of the Ministerial Code by the Environment Minister? Well, uh, insofar as these matters have been publicly uh, accounted for, um, it was, it's a matter of record that I feel that the Minister uh, acted outside of his powers and therefore I uh, instructed uh, departmental solicitors to look at this matter. The pre-action letter has been sent in relation to the judicial review. Um, there has been a, a meeting between myself and the Minister of the Environment, a meeting I thought uh, which was quite helpful. Um, however, uh, the matter has not progressed beyond that, so uh, it appears as if uh, we are moving uh, inexorably towards the courts, which is regrettable, uh, but I don't see any other uh, way in which to deal with this unless the Minister of the Environment changes his current stance. Well, Mr Given for supplementary. I appreciate the, the answer the Minister has provided, and I appreciate the attempts at mediation that she has sought to try and deal with this to avoid it going to the courts and avoiding, obviously, the use of public funds to deal with the matter that the Minister for Environment should properly reflect upon and come back to the executive to seek consensus on. Does the Minister agree with me that Sprucefield does present a regionally significant uh, opportunity to develop the retail sector, uh, and it is vitally important that Sprucefield is given uh, the uh, space that it needs to bring forward planning applications such as John Lewis that would provide tens of millions of pounds of investment and create hundreds of uh, jobs at a time in which our Northern Ireland economy uh, would need that type of investment. Well, I thank the member uh, for his uh, points in relation to Sprucefield. I don't think there's any doubt that Sprucefield, uh, given the connectivity that it has with the motorways uh, and indeed with the A1 uh, moving towards the border and on then to Dublin, is very much uh, an area which should be open to development. Uh, I'm loath to get into the details of uh, the subject matter of the judicial review, uh, but suffice it to say that there's a wider issue at stake here, as well as the very important issue, and I can understand why he raises the issue in relation to Lagan Valley, but there's a wider issue here in relation uh, to the ministerial code and the proper way in which to take decisions uh, at the executive, um, because frankly, if uh, a number of us decided to take uh, the particular route the Minister of Environment took, uh, there would be a number of things put out uh, that hadn't been agreed, uh, but which we perhaps may have wanted to have brought forward. Uh, I think immediately of the tourism strategy for one, uh, which we may have been able to uh, deal with uh, more proactively. But that's where we are, and uh, I hope, even at this late stage, that we'll not have to go to the courts. Pat Sheeks for a topical question. Can I, I'll go to last Concord. Uh, can I ask the Minister for an update on her department's efforts to attract investment into West Belfast? Can I, good. Well, I thank the member for his question. As the member knows, we had a very significant uh, announcement recently in relation to Delta Print and Packaging, and he will say yes, that's an indigenous 
uh, company, um, but I, I hope he recognises that it's a, a global company with uh, operations all across the world now. Uh, we supported that company in a very meaningful way to make sure that those jobs stayed in West Belfast and weren't uh, taken elsewhere in the globe. Um, uh, and uh, that itself presented itself uh, as a challenge, but we took that challenge forward and I took the matter to the executive and thankfully had the backing of all of my executive colleagues. So we continue uh, to provide uh, finance and activity in uh, West Belfast as we do all of the other regions across Northern Ireland. Mr. Sheehan, for supplementary. I thank the Minister for her answer. And, uh, I wonder, could she outline how her department uses uh, uh, varying uh, financial uh, incentives to entice potential employers into deprived areas? Well, I think uh, if the member cares to look at the uh offer that was given to the particular uh, firm I have mentioned, he will see uh, that we stretched ourselves in relation uh, to what we were able to do uh, there, and that was the reason why it was taken uh, to the executive, so that we could secure those jobs uh, in West Belfast. But he should not just uh, look at money. It's also about support and trying to help people to start their own businesses, to have an entrepreneurial spirit in that area. And so it's about working with those people in the area, try and get them uh, to, to see beyond just uh, relying on the grant culture, which in some areas uh, has grown up over the years. And I think it's something that we need to get away from and indeed look at innovation and entrepreneurial uh, ways of doing things moving into the future. This is Sandra Overend for a topical question. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. In view of the current transition period um, in local government, uh, what changes does the Minister envisage in the rural remit, a uh, scope and number of local economic uh, development agencies across Northern Ireland? Well, of course, that's a, a matter for Enterprise NI, mostly uh, themselves, working with the local councils. There's a number of enterprise uh, units right across Northern Ireland. Uh, most of them fall under the umbrella of Enterprise NI, and they will have to find a new, if you like, relationship uh, with the council, because, of course, uh, the Regional Start programme uh, will be one of those programmes that actually is devolved down to the, the local councils uh, and uh, therefore they will have control of it and that has been uh, delivered uh, for a number of years now by Enterprise NI and by the local enterprise agency so they will need to engage in the community uh, plan for their particular areas to make sure that they have a role in relation to economic development. This is over and for supplementary. I thank you and thank the Minister for her response. Up until now, there, there is a, a variation across Northern Ireland in the level and shape of local economic development agencies. Given that we are in a transition period, does the Minister agree that we should be looking to learn lessons from the experience of local enterprise partnerships in England, which have been operating for several years? Well, I would agree with her that there have been um, Varying levels, of, varying levels of success of enterprise agencies across Northern Ireland. But thankfully, we have some very, very good examples of enterprise agencies uh, in Northern Ireland. So if uh, the member is asking me, do we need to learn from best practice? Absolutely, we need to learn from best practice. And whether that's in England or indeed here in Northern Ireland with some of our enterprise agencies, then that's certainly the route we should be going down. Call Ms. Paula Bradley for a topical question. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, could I ask the Minister if she would comment on the potential impact in the fall in crude, in crude oil prices and what this might have on uh, fuel poverty in Northern Ireland? And certainly. Uh during the work that has been ongoing um, between the regulator and the department, um, we have often been frustrated in relation to what is it we can intervene on in relation to price. We've talked about energy costs here in this house on a number of occasions. And, um, Part of the difficulty has been that the wholesale costs make up around two-thirds of the energy costs of the consumer. So I would be hopeful, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, that given the price of crude oil, is falling back, um, that we should see some reflection of that in the wholesale costs, particularly in relation to electricity. 
But I do caution against um, price volatility because if we have a drop in the crude oil and that allows us to have lower energy costs in one month, we certainly don't want to see it going back up when the crude oil price uh, jumps back up again. So we need to be careful uh, not to have price volatility. But I would be hopeful if the crude oil price stays low for a period of time that that then can be reflected uh, in the electricity uh, prices to the consumer. Call Ms. Bradley for supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answer. And she's kind of answered my supplementary as well, because I was going to ask her um, about the electricity and how that, uh, if she can actually expand on that, and how that's going to be reflected on the electricity costs. Well, I, I mean, ultimately, that's a matter for the utility regulator in conjunction with the uh, energy firms. But she has indicated to me. Um, that she wants to move away from a, from a period of time where you had a, uh, a large cut in one half of the year and then a rise in the other half of the year because that doesn't help uh, consumers to plan, if you like. They like certainty and they like to be able to plan into the future. So uh, I'm sure if the utility regulator were here, she would say the one thing she doesn't want to see is price volatility. Call Mr. Danny Kinnan for a topical question. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, the Minister, well, I welcome many of the Invest NI's um, successes recently, but it, does any study go on at the same time to the effects it has on competing businesses in the same areas or in how it actually affects the trade of even the smaller or, or less large companies in the same areas? Well, I think the member is referring to displacement, um, and it's something that Invest Northern Ireland does take a, a lot of cognizance of. It's one of the reasons why we look at a firm and, and try to assess what are its capabilities to export into a different market, and so we try to provide them with support uh, to do that. Um, it's one of the reasons why we don't get involved with those uh, firms, and sometimes people challenge me around this. Why do you not support uh, Mrs. X, who's a hairdresser in Balamani? Uh, well, if we started to support all of the hairdressers around Northern Ireland, that would be, you know, we would just be displacing people uh, around Northern Ireland. So displacement is very much something that we look at, and uh, I know Invest Northern Ireland is very cognizant of that when they're uh, looking to support companies that they don't displace it uh, from another company. Call Mr. Kinnahan for supplementary. Thank you very much. Um, I mean, sort of following on to that, I mean, one of her colleagues in, uh, on the Deti Committee mentioned that we go for the big hit with a trickle-down effect. When looking at either the displacement or how it affects the competitors, is she looking at a, a strategy lower down for smaller businesses or the less big businesses to make sure that they can all pick up from that trickle-down that's, that's coming? Uh, yes, absolutely. And so if we have companies that want to get into the supply chain of some of our larger companies like Almac or FG Wilson or some of those companies, then we will try and support them to do that. And that's through the Boosting Business campaign, which you may recall we launched at the time of the recession, uh, which comprised, yes, the jobs fund, but it also comprised a number of advisory um, helps uh, to give assistance to companies that perhaps uh, would not normally seek assistance from Invest Northern Ireland. So boosting business is very much uh, looking at that whole area of trying to help businesses, which, and I don't like using the phrase, are lower down uh, in the food chain from some of our bigger companies. Call Mr. William Humphrey for topical questions. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy, Deputy Speaker. Can the Minister comment on the ongoing campaign to have corporation tax devolved to Northern Ireland? Well, yes, and this is a, a campaign that has been going on for quite some considerable time, a campaign supported uh, by the five parties uh, in the executive, a campaign that is supported by the wider business community in Northern Ireland because they realise the benefits uh, that will flow uh, from a lower corporation tax here, uh, rate here in Northern Ireland. And uh, when I listen to some people talk about uh, the corporate tax issue and they say it's all speculative, how do you know what's going to happen? We have had numerous uh, people exa examine the evidence base and they have told us that we will have tens of thousands of jobs coming to Northern Ireland over a period of time if we are able to have the lower rate of corporation tax. So I very much support the campaign and I hope that we have an answer from the Prime Minister uh, in early December. Humphrey for supplement. 
Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for an answer. Can I ask the Minister, does the Minister believe that Northern Ireland will have the necessary skills and infrastructure to attract new companies to invest in Northern Ireland? Well, I think from an Invest Northern Ireland perspective, it will certainly change the way in which they interact with companies globally, uh, particularly in America. Uh, but we're ready for that change if and when it comes, because even though the uh, devolution of corporation tax uh, should be either or, should be announced in uh, December, uh, we will have a period of time during which we can uh, change the way in which we do business from an Invest Northern Ireland perspective. And I know that the Dell Minister has also been looking into what he needs to do in relation to skills if it were the case that we were able to have a lower rate of corporation tax. Well, Mr Roy Beggs. <coughs> the Regional Development Minister, Danny Kennedy, has indicated that both the A8 and A2 roads are progressing well. So would the Minister advise us, is she keeping and both Northern Ireland Tourist Board and indeed Invest NI fully up to date with the projects so that tourists and indeed new businesses will be able to be advised of the advantages that exist in my, for my constituents in Larne, Carrick, Fergus and Newton Abbey and the businesses will be able to consider re relocating to that area. I was just establishing from my colleagues here the, where the A2 and A8 was. Forgive me, I am a humble Fermanagh representative um, and understand they're to Carrick and Larne. Am I correct in that? Yes. Um, well, I know more about the A4 and the A29. But um, let me say this. When we have upgrade of infrastructure, it certainly does help in relation uh, to uh, the offering to inward investors and also in relation to tourism. And we will, of course, be taking cognizance of any upgrades in relation to infrastructure, no matter where it is in Northern Ireland. Carter, time is up.